Okay, thanks very much. I'd uh, like to start by acknowledging that we're on Wadjup land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I want to thank Neil and the Perth branch of the Australian Society for the Study of Labour History as a title and a half, for your kind invitation to deliver the Harold Peden lecture this year. Um, in doing so, I note that one of your objectives is, objectives is to make history a vital part of popular consciousness and a matter for reflection and debate, according to the website. So um, I hope this presentation contributes to uh, furthering that objective. Um, earlier this year, Neil uh, suggested that I talk about my work during the during my years with the CPSU and CSA and what it, lead, what it means to lead a large public sector union. So I have been reflecting a bit on what it is to be a public sector union leader. Um, and at the time that Neil approached me, I had not anticipated that I'd be moving on from that role and would be joining the Industrial Relations uh, Commission, which I do in just over a little uh, a week and a little bit. Um, this unanticipated eventuality had resulted in even more navel gazing on my part, but I don't really intend to share all of that and bore you with that tonight. But in answering the big questions of life, I found it's always helpful and grounding to get your children's perspective. Some years ago, one of my son's primary school teachers reported to me that when asked what their parents did for a job, um, my son Joshua said a very interesting thing. Now, I thought that he would say something noble like, Mum works in the interests of working people. Mum rights the wrongs of society. Mum strives for fairness. Um, but, you know, my son said, Mum gets paid for messing with the government. <laughs> <So> <laughs> and now, at the age of 20 years, Joshua's description of my work remains much the same and is a family joke, in joke. <laughs> so I'll come back to this later um, to share you my thoughts on Joshua's colourful turn of phrase. <laughs> so to some personal reflections, I started my first full-time job in the state public service in the 80s at the Valuer General's office. Um, after one year of that, I moved on to then Telecom and for about six months before finding a fabulous place in the newly minted Equal Opportunity Commission. So those were halcyon days where our problem was spending all of the money that the state government had given us. No agency ever reports that as a problem at the moment. Um, and uh, while we had to learn what, what that procuring Wedgwood for the staff room was not really appropriate, um, and I hasten to add that was not my decision, but you can read all about it in Hansard if you have a mind to. Um, but it was also a days of great change for the WA Public Service. So after all, there was a Labor government in power and all public servants know that means big change. One of those changes was developing and adopting workplace policies around and practices concerning sex and race discrimination and sexual harassment. So I was keenly interested in these coming from the Equal Opportunity Commission and I wanted to contribute my knowledge and expertise to this quest and found a way through the union, um, the then CSA before we became the CPG CSA, um, as a workplace rep, delegate and as a councillor on the Committee of Management. <coughs> I soon discovered that there were actually big changes occurring in the union as well at the time. The position of secretary was no longer to be an appointment by the committee of management, but would go become an office to be elected by the whole of the membership. And the CSA was evolving from an association to being a union and would soon engage its members in action, protesting a number of decisions of the Burke Labor government. So one of those changes I think Neil um, referred to in that uh, there was certainly a push for um, the association to uh, no longer be a gentleman's club as well, but to change, uh, to be more inclusive and to diversify its representation and leadership, <clears throat> albeit that it took it some time to do that. Um, in the public sector, and context is always important, um, it was also a time that new public management or public sector managerialism came to town. So essentially this ideology or model for public services shifts from the traditional model of government accountability through the ballot box to one of managerial accountability. So that is about um, no, uh, 
of moving away from a view that the complexity of the public service delivery requires professional and political judgment about individual and community needs. Instead, political questions of priority are transported into supposedly scientific or technical solutions. Um, and the democratic ideal of a universal public service is replaced with a fragmented and uneven system founded on market-driven notions of efficiency, competition and consumer demand. Additionally, people are no longer regarded as citizens and players with rights and responsibilities in the social contract but are now considered to be clients, customers or consumers. The marketisation of the public service has always struck me as being ironic. Public services and the public sector after all, after all was established as a response to discontent with the appalling social conditions in a rapidly industrialising nations. And state intervention was aimed at addressing the worst excesses of the free market. For this intervention, the state, to now be incorporated into the free market to me is an apparent and obvious contradiction. Also at this time I was become significantly more invested in the impacts for people uh, working in public service around new public management and, um, and uh, what that meant for working conditions as well as for public service workers and for them as citizens because I took up a full-time job as an industrial officer with the CSA. Um, I initially accepted a six-month secondment working on a a specific project and had expected to return back to the Equal Opportunity Commission but um, I just never actually went back so <laughs> I found myself uh, uh, being an industrial officer, senior industrial officer, chief industrial officer over a number of years. Um, but I also found in that time a witness that the ethos of new public sector management um, uh, what the impacts that was having on um, the work in public services, but not just on public servants and the workers, but also on the union itself. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today in terms of uh, what's in the public interest. Um, and that is the relationship between um, citizens um, and organised labour in the form of public service unions and particularly reflect on what the CPSU CSA response has been to new public sector management and managerialism. I want to focus on the public interest in having a strong, vibrant public sector union, not only because governments ought to be model employers, novel, and not only because contented public servants serve the public well, but because public service unions are fundamental to our democracy. In doing this, I want to talk about my observations of the impact of public service policies and strategies that applied, have been applied in response during my time at the union. So let's just return for a moment to the 80 and early 90s and to the story of the changes in the public service at that time. A feature of the new ethos was to replace centralised pay determination systems with decentralised pay and performance systems. For the West Australian Public Service, the push for decentralisation of wage determination was, giving, was given a helping hand with the union movement's adoption of enterprise bargaining. Um, in addition, the Lawrence Labor government promoted the concept of decentralised bargaining. Um, this decentralised bargaining system resulted in different bargaining outcomes for each of the hundred or more state public sector agencies. So every department had a different agreement, different wage rate, different conditions. Uh, this was further decentralised and differentiated because of um, the introduction of individual workplace agreements. So individual workers in 1994 onwards um, could have a separate and different agreement through the utilisation of individual employment um, agreements permitted under legislation promoted by the Liberal government which was elected in 93. So the practical impact for the union um, was that we focused all of our energies and efforts on wage and condition bargaining and we did that with one hand tied behind our back. So um, apart from it being really, really exhausting for anybody involved in that process, um, the size of the bargaining unit that we were um, involved with was significantly smaller. Um, and was diminished our power and so our outcomes were also significantly reduced. Um, 
And so along with other union busting strategies at the time and, and tactics employed by the Liberal government, such as the cessation of payroll deductions just before Christmas in 1997, um, this set the union back and it is true to say we have not ever really completely recovered that ground loss to date. I remember that well because I remember I was um, then pregnant with my son and uh, was, um, was in hospital having been um, sectioned off and told not to, uh, uh, not, not to go back to work and that um, indeed my son was delivered four or five weeks early and I remember being on a teleconference in my hospital room in the hospital with nurses coming in as I stuck over the pillow over the teleconference over the phone going, I'm not doing anything, I'm actually not doing anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> until the, uh, they went out and the nurse goes out of the room and back on the teleconference and hoped I hadn't missed a vital vote. So <laughs> it's uh, all fun and games in the union movement, um, always. So... Um, so one of the other features of um, uh, this new public sector managerialism, which we are not yet finished with, by the way, it's still live and well in the public sector, is that it requires people to do more with less. There's a focus on reducing the size of government. There's a wish to privatise as much public service delivery as possible. Um, there's a desire to shift from social, uh, social services from being the responsibility of government to being the responsibility of the community. Um, and uh, there's a wish to reduce um, government intervention that's usually described as reducing red tape. Um, and uh, they characterise users of public services as customers and clients and also wish to reduce the citizen rights for public service workers. So thinking about that last element, which I think is pretty important um, in the context of uh, workers being able to exercise their role as public servants and work in the public interest, um, citizenship at the workplace incorporates a whole range of different issues for people, but essentially is embedded in the concept of fairness. So it means workers being able to have freedom of speech, having individual freedom and right to enter into discourse and dialogue, um, and having a right to participate in fair and free elections, um, and having a right to fairness and ability to maintain standards of living. Um, what we're seeing increasingly in the public service and what we're finding we're fighting against a lot um, and defending individuals' rights is to, for them to be able to participate in communication methods and having discourse and dialogue um, as an individual person, um, whether that be in their own time, on their own Facebook page, um, without using any government resources whatsoever. So. What I think is that uh, public sector unions need to be instrumental in a sense.